Welcome to today's webinar, Advancements in Dementia Care. I'm your host, Jennifer Evans. And in honor of Alzheimer's Awareness Month, today we're going to talk about advancements in dementia care, from adaptive technology to caregiving solutions and ways to help preserve precious memories. And towards the end of today's webinar, our panelists are also going to take any questions you have. So before I introduce you to our panelists, let's just talk a minute about Zoom and how you can interact with us during the webinar. So things can be different from one computer to the next. But if you look at the bottom of the Zoom screen where you're seeing this webinar, you'll see some icons. The one on the far left is usually a microphone. And we've muted all your voices so that there's no background sound. But I'll explain how you can ask questions or ask for any technical help you need. So the other buttons, the most important, is the one that says Q&A and the one that says chat. When you click the Q&A button, a window is going to appear where you can type any questions you have for our Q&A session at the end. So feel free to start asking questions during the presentation using the Q&A, and at the end, we're gonna to get to as many of them as we can. The chat button opens up a window where you can chat with the moderator, our presenters, and if you're having any technical difficulties, let us know in the chat. Our moderators are here in the background and they'll help you if they can, right? You're also going to get a follow-up email with all of this information you're hearing today, as well as a recording of this webinar, so you can refer to it later or share it with your friends and loved ones, okay? Ready to go? All right, let's get started by introducing our guest speakers. First up, we have Juliette Holtklinger, who is Brookdale's Senior Director of Dementia Care. And Juliette is a gerontologist specializing in person-centered programs for people living with dementia. And as an educator and program designer for more than 35 years, she's responsible for Brookdale's dementia care program development, implementation, and quality assurance for the company's nearly 400 dementia care communities. And she provides strategy development innovation. She also currently serves as a board member of the Pioneer Network, which is an organization devoted to the promotion of person-centered care and changing the perceptions of aging. So welcome, Juliet. Thanks, thanks for having me. Our next guest is Jack York. Jack is the co-founder and the president of It's Never Too Late. And this is a company founded on the idea that there is always time to live a fulfilling life. And when Jack saw how conventional technology was too difficult for many older adults to use, he decided to find ways to make supportive technology more accessible to those that it could help. And now he speaks worldwide on how technology can create personalized connections for older adults and their loved ones. Hey, Jack, thanks for being here. All right, thanks, Janet, happy to be here. Great. Finally, with us today is Jay Newton-Small. Jay is the CEO and founder of Memory Well, a network of writers who help tell and save the stories of seniors nationwide. And the inspiration for this company was for five, who had been a correspondent for Time Magazine, where Jay is now a contributor. She wanted to make sure that her father's stories weren't lost to Alzheimer's. Jay also wrote the 2016 best-selling book, Broad Influence, How Women Are Changing the Way America Works. She also holds fellowships from Halcyon Incubator, New America, and the Harvard Institute on Politics. And she won the Dirksen Award for Congressional Reporting. Welcome, Jay. So Juliet, why Thanks don't you- Thanks so much, Janet, sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. I know, taking ourselves off mute so quick. So Juliet, why don't you start us off with a bit of the history and advancements that have happened in dementia care? Great, thanks, Janet. Happy to start off and happy to be here with my friends, Jack and Jay. Um, we're gonna have a, a great session here today. I thought it'd be interesting. I've been doing this work a long time as my bio suggests, and I thought it'd be interesting before we talk about advancements to talk a little bit about where we've been. Um, so I'm gonna give you a very brief, very brief um, history of really dementia care uh, in the US. So 1906, we all know that uh, Alzheimer's disease was, uh, was named in that year. Doesn't mean it didn't exist before then, but uh, Dr. Alzheimer named it after himself. Uh, so we had the birth of Alzheimer's disease as we know it. In the early half of the 20th century, you know, folks with dementia were really cared for at home. 
Um, sometimes if they didn't have family, they would uh, live in almshouses or houses for the poor, houses, homes for the aged. Um, 1965, we saw the birth of Medicare and Medicaid uh, and really the birth of the modern nursing home, which is uh, where most people with dementia, if they were cared for in a care setting, uh, lived in nursing homes. In 1981, the first assisted living model opened. While this wasn't dedicated to dementia care, in particular, it really certainly uh, started a whole new model of care. 1987 was a sentinel year in long-term care. Uh, President Reagan signed into law really the largest sweeping set of nursing home reforms that had ever hit America, something called the OBRA, Omnibus Reconciliation Act. And this really changed a lot of regulations about how we provide care and particularly how we provide care for people living with dementia. I started uh, working in nursing homes in 1985. So I know um, I, I was there when these regulations came on board and I know it really, it really prompted us to think very differently about how we cared for uh, folks living with dementia. In 1987 or so, it's very difficult to find this history, um, we really, between 1987, so mid-1980s to the 2000s, uh, we really saw the evolution from the secured unit um, of a nursing home um, into really eventually the rise of assisted living and dedicated dementia care spaces. Um, the 2000s have been all about really perfecting that model, in my opinion, and continued evolution and perfection of that residential specialized dementia care. We know it needs a consistent routine, curated approaches by care partners who are really well-trained in dementia, behavioral problem solving, specialized environments now uh, for dementia, and really well-organized days um, of engagement for people living with dementia. Next slide. So I wanna to talk today about the greatest influences um, on the advancements of dementia care. You know, it's really back in the old days, we had an old view of dementia and our view has really changed. You know, we these were some quotes from some slides I had, or maybe they were overheads, right? <laughs> back in the day, um, the long goodbye, the 10 year funeral. I actually had a slide that said, this is a disease that robs a person of all that makes them human. I don't think we think that way anymore, and that's a good thing. So we've really seen, I, I always use this graphic um, when talking about this old view, because I think we see it a lot when it's uh, pertaining to dementia and you really see it's just this, you know, real message about loss of self and loss of humanity, which we know now is not true. So there was an evolution. Um, what we really found uh, being in, in the field as long as I have is that our beliefs about people with dementia really shaped the way that programming and care um, was provided. You know, in the old days, we believed people with dementia couldn't learn anything new. Uh, we believed they couldn't contribute to the learning of others. Uh, we believed they certainly couldn't use technology. Um, they couldn't grow. Uh, as people, it couldn't be trusted, right, with real live children or pets or real plants or tasks or scissors. Um, and we really believed that they were all the same. You know, we, the diagnosis of dementia was all that we saw. Um, that really led to care and programming that didn't meet needs. Um, it led to these cookie cutter programmings, you know, kind of going from one holiday to the next real passive programs, us doing and them watching, um, programs that didn't honor preferences or cultural heritage, and programs that really didn't exercise remaining talents and skills. That, I think, led to some pretty poor outcomes. Uh, disengagement, uh, depression, increased levels of depression, and this dependency that really kind of made folks um, function at a lower level than their dementia really should allow them to, to function at. We saw a lot of behavioral expressions and we saw um, a high use of psychotropic medications. Not that those two things aren't still uh, concerns. And we really saw a decreased quality of life. We knew something needed to change. Again, that evolution in our thinking has really helped. Next slide. 
So our changing perspectives. I love these pictures and this quote together. Uh, my friend, Dr. Alan Power uh, has a great quote. It's time to change our minds about people whose minds have changed. And I think that's really, really important. Um, up here uh, on the top uh, photo here, you see some women who are baking an apple pie. They're making apple pie. They're cutting up the apple with real knives. No one's stabbing each other. No one's hurting each other. Um, they're doing just fine because they know what they're doing. They know how to make apple pie much better than we do. Um, this gentleman uh, in the picture below is helping out our maintenance uh, tech paint some rooms. He was a painter in his former life um, and, uh, and actually, you know, provides a lot of help uh, as he follows our maintenance uh, person around. Next slide. So our changing view of dementia, here's another quote I think that's very powerful. Uh, Dr. Atul Gawande, um, who wrote a book called Being Mortal, which is a great read uh, if, uh, if you're looking for something to read. And he talks about the changing evolution in medicine and person-centered care in medicine in the book. And I love this quote, we've been wrong about what our job is in medicine. We think our job is to ensure health and survival, but really it is larger than that. It's to enable well-being. That's, that's our, uh, our belief too at Brookdale. I love this photo and it, it, it really speaks to the relationship that happens in our communities and how important that is. So our changing view of dementia really involves changing that perspective and shifting the view um, away from dementia as purely a biomedical concern that the, the doctor and, and medicines are going to address. And really that view of what is wrong with the person, the focusing on the symptoms. Instead, we have shifted to a more holistic, what we call biopsychosocial view, uh, promoting well-being and living well with dementia, which promotes engagement and partnering approach from our care uh, partners, a positive environment and focusing on what's right with the person and what does the person still have to contribute. We've reframed our view of dementia um, and really adopted person-centered care values and practices. Person-centered practices have also been a great influence on the advancement of dementia care. Um, knowing the person, seeing the person living with dementia as a unique and individual human being, asking who and was this person behind the disease, not just seeing the disease meeting the person at their point of need and supporting their highest level of capability and participation, believing in their talents and skills, regardless of the level of dementia. Each person can and does make a difference and has something to teach us. Uh, Risk-taking is a normal part of life and shouldn't all risk shouldn't be removed just because a person has dementia. And really promoting the growth and development of all is important. So what can prevent a person uh, with dementia from being well-known? We're gonna hear a little bit later from Jay about uh, telling stories, but people with dementia have difficulty sometimes telling us their own story in their own words. Um, but also sometimes I think we don't get to know people with dementia because we view that person through the lens of dementia. We see them as no longer really connected to their past or their community or family and friends. We see that loss of self that I've talked about. And we think, you know, they're not good historians. Um, and so we've asked ourselves these questions, you know, how can we overcome this stigma in our own practice at Brookdale and view the person, person living with dementia in another lens, through another lens? Uh, can a tool help us connect uh, who they were prior to the disease to who they are now? I love these photos as well. This woman uh, came to live with us in one of our crossings programs. Um, and she, she was kind of cantankerous, not in the best mood, didn't really want to be there. We didn't know much about her. She was very quiet, didn't really want to talk about herself. We didn't have a good sense of who she was. And then her daughter-in-law brought in some photos for us and uh, we learned that she actually had quite a colorful past. She was a buffalo rider in the wild 
Bill Buffalo show uh, and traveled uh, the, the country as a young woman um, riding buffaloes for a living, which uh, certainly uh, was a first for many of us. Next slide. So at the same time that our, you know, our views are changing about people with dementia, we're getting barraged with all kinds of new technology. I probably have a different technology vendor or person reach out to me every week to uh, look at what they've, they've uh, invented. Um, you know, there's just all kinds of everything from wearables to falls detection to robots uh, and engagement technology. So it was really important that we begin to look at how can some of these tools help us provide better person-centered dementia care. Of course, we had to start that journey um, by confronting some of our own ageism. Um, and I think ageism has really shaped, if not curbed, uh, people's perception of how elders can adopt technology. You know, people thought I was crazy when I said I wanted to put computers in every single one of our uh, Clarebridge locations for the residents to use. The residents, we didn't even have computers at that point in our in, uh, independent living or assisted living communities. So I'm happy to say the residents with dementia were the first to adopt to technology. But I Googled uh, older adult and uh, computers, and this is what came up. Right, this is the perception um, of, of people, uh, older adults and their adoption. We found the opposite to be true. People with dementia adopt very well to the use of technology. So here's a smattering um, of, of some of the technology uh, that we're using currently. You know, All of these changes um, have really paved the way for us to use technology. And to I think technology is the new prescription uh, for the treatment of dementia care. Here you see uh, the robot companion pets. These are um, sensing robots. These are amazingly uh, lifelike. It, this robot is under $100 um, and can be used in any setting. Um, the chair, not at quite uh, as an affordable price point. Um, this is a very specialized uh, relaxation chair for dementia um, that has music that plays and, and has a series of rocking motions. Um, very interesting technology that we're using in a few of our Clarebridges. The uh, It's Never Too Late, which Jack is gonna to talk to you a little bit about is our, our standard platform for engagement in Clarebridge. And this light wellness system that um, actually was developed for the training of elite athletes uh, and their neuroplasticity uh, and really working on the brains of, of elite athletes. And we're using that now in our dementia care uh, communities to help with therapies and helping people uh, with dementia, um, with hand-eye coordination and some of these other uh, brain pathways. So lots of ways that we're using technology uh, in, in uh, our Claridge communities. Well, wow, that's great. Thank you, Juliet. There's really amazing technology here at Brookdale, not just elevating the care for the residents, but also helping them stay connected with their families. So why don't we turn it over to Jack with It's Never Too Late. And Jack, why don't you tell us a little bit about your work with Brookdale? I gotta say, Juliet, the, uh, the, the buffalo, you, you gotta love that buffalo picture. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really yeah. what it all comes down to. Cause I think, and, and I love, uh, Juliet and I have spoken many times over the years and I always enjoy listening to her and just the, the education she, she brings to it. Uh, I, it's every too late or IN2L is how we're known sometimes. We've been around for 21 years and our the whole start of the company was simply a friend of mine had lived next door to an assisted living community and saw that these residents looked bored. <laughs> and so she talked me into uh, donating a couple of computers to that uh, community in Southern California and uh, just fell in love with this whole opportunity to be able to uh, just just change the perspective that that people had and I, and I went into it and why I part of why I love speaking with Juliet is because she's been such a mentor to me over the years if uh, if there's ever a jeopardy category of dementia I would call uh, Juliet right away to walk me through but it it, it when you really cut through it it's not it, it's there's such a common sense component to it 
And this whole, what you're looking at right here, this whole engagement matters. I mean, that's really what we've, we've built our company on is that it does matter to be engaged. But I think what happens, uh, whether it's just aging or whether you're talking specifically about dementia, people get put into a box that's totally irrelevant. And I, Juliet, you get sick of hearing some of my analogies, but I, uh, I, I, ever since I was about 16 years old, I've been a big Bruce Springsteen guy. And so, you know, whether I'm 16 or 30 or 40 or 50, and now I'm 61, I, I am a big Springsteen guy. So it's not like I'm going to become 70 and, and damn it, get me the carpenters. You know, I mean, it just, you, we are who we are and it, and it's, there, there's good things about us and there, and there's maybe not so good things about us. And what, the, the brilliance of how uh, Brookdale, I think, has integrated IN2L uh, into their programming uh, under Juliet's direction has been to really take that, that concept that she's talking about, that whole each person having their own experience, meeting people where they are, not having the stereotype. Technology is, is a tool to get there. It's a tool to get to, again, forget your age, forget your cognition. Uh, to, 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 to you, Janet, maybe you're going to want to see some kind of religious experience and I'm going to want to see something else. And I'm going to want to see the Nebraska Cornhuskers and Juliet's husband's going to want to see the Chicago Cubs. And it's, it's just about technology as this tool. And I'm so unbelievably optimistic because it's just getting easier and easier, better and better. Uh, as a way to get there. So there's lots of data to back it up that you see here, but to me, it's very much driven on a common sense context. So the next slide is where, uh, where you know, where we've gotten most of our good ideas, and that's the Jetsons. <laughs> For, depends on the age of the folks out there, whether they get it or not. But uh, hey, when I was a kid, I loved watching George talking to Jane and uh, that kind of halfway between a television and a telephone and how just how easy that connection was and, and look at how it is right now. And, and I get it that we're all zoomed out, but what a cool thing to be able to do a conversation like this. I have three kids all in their twenties and, and once a week we're playing board games online and they're all over. And it's, it's just remarkable. These tools that we kind of take for granted, why not make them accessible for people living with dementia and to Brookdale's credit, to Juliet's credit, they embraced this 10 years ago uh, from our standpoint when other people weren't even talking about it. So this is a great example. You're looking at here of, uh, of, an ex of a, a multi-sensory approach. You've got a gentleman celebrating his 94th birthday, zooming in with his kids and, and grandkids all over the country, a cake right there in front of him. It's kind of hard to see, but my favorite part of this picture is the Motor Trend magazine that he has off to the side. And so again, uh, Juliet and Brookdale just speak to that. It's not that technology is, is everything. It's one piece of a puzzle uh, that's there to help make a person's life better. So just kind of moving ahead, uh, what uh, Brookdale has done uh, to our delight is they took our product of IN2L and they rebranded it, renamed it, uh, put some of their own content into it, and, uh, and we've been a part of the, the Brookdale experience now since 2013. And uh, we're, as the years go by, we really become a content company as much as anything else. And that content consisting of, of vetted content for older adults that matches different levels of cognition, but ties people to, to travel, to spirituality, to games, to puzzles, to newspapers, to museums. And as you'll see, as Juliet kind of walks you through some of the ways that our, our product has been used in our community, it really is, uh, it's not a one size fit all approach. It's what, it's not technology for technology's sake. It's what the, what's the technology that, that makes George come to life? What's the technology that keeps Mabel engaged? And to, to one person, it's going to be one thing. To somebody else, it's going to be something else. There's just so many ways uh, to stay connected. All right, so I'm sorry. Go ahead to the next uh, slide. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna walk, uh, kind of turn it over to Juliet, who's gonna be walking you through. These are you're gonna you're 
you're looking at examples of IN2L uh, implemented within uh, within Brookdale and the Clare the Clare Bridges. Uh, you know, I can talk through this stuff, but it's a heck of a lot. If, if I'm in the audience, I want to hear from, <laughs> from Juliet describing it more than uh, more than the IN2L perspective. But I tell you, I it it warms my heart to see these pictures and hear the stories. So go ahead, Juliet. Yeah, uh, just a couple of you know, a couple of stories here. The woman on the left is actually, and some of these are are pretty recent examples. Um, we're certainly relying on technology such as IN2L right now to do connections outside of our communities. The woman on the left was a former tennis player and is in here is um, uh, connecting over Zoom, I believe, with the um, University of Northern uh, University of North Carolina uh, tennis women's tennis team, and uh, they were exchanging some conversation about um, tennis and. Um, reading a book together on tennis. So just fascinating connection, intergenerational, great intergenerational. The woman on the right is um, being guided through her old neighborhood by Google Earth. Um, and this is a very uh, popular activity that we do often. Um, and Google Earth, you can, you know, you can pull that down on any computer. Um, and it's a really fascinating thing for folks to be able to go through their old neighborhoods, staying connected. The woman on the left here, um, Lillian, is uh, in her 90s uh, and lived in one of our communities and um, hadn't seen her sister in close to a decade. Her sister, also in her 90s, uh, lived um, very, very far away across the country. You know, these two ladies were never going to be in the same room again physically. And uh, they were able, we were able to connect um, the, uh, the two residents with Skype. And um, they ended up Skyping nearly every day and having sister chats every day um, and really were able to reconnect in a beautiful way over Skype. Um, on the right is uh, Edna, who is spending her 103rd birthday here um, using the system and playing a trivia game. She's actually using one of the reaching tools to help her with the touch screen. Great way to spend her 103rd birthday. Next slide. This is a video that I think really uh, does a great job of um, explaining the connections that we make uh, via the system. Go ahead. Well, you know, um, there's one, and I and I keep t I keep telling my friends this story. I remember when we were one 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 year when we were camping at Yosemite, we were with uh, Ken and Louise. Um, gosh, I can't remember their last name. Ken and Louise, they had a boy named Rick and Ricky. I can't remember what their last name was. But anyway, we were camping with them. Jackson. Jackson, that's right. Ken and Louise Jackson and Ricky Jackson, yeah. And um, it was in the evening and you, <laughs> you, went and hid behind uh, the garbage cans and somebody had Louise go take the garbage to the garbage garbage cans and when she got to the yeah you were terrible <laughs> when she got to the garbage can to empty the garbage in there um, you you jumped up from behind the garbage cans and went Rawr! like that like a bear and um, it scared the the limit daylights out of her, and she she ran screaming away, and everybody was laughing. And, and <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Louise thought it was so funny. No, I don't think so either. <laughs> but everybody else did. But oh, that was that was hysterical. That was so <laughs> funny. <laughs> so I. So just a great example of, and you know, thankfully the person with dementia was there to help her remember the the name, right? Go ahead, Jack. I think yeah. uh, you're up on this one. Yeah, just this is a great example of, and this is from three years ago, and and it's just a great merging of education and and senior living. That uh, this is a community in uh, in California where the husband and the wife are are uh, the wife is living with dementia, and that's their grandson, and the the grammar school that he goes to 
the teacher was sending the lesson plan to the community a week in advance, uh, and you'd be able to have this interaction between the grandparents and the grandson. So uh, go ahead and hit the clip. Just play it for about 10 seconds. Yeah. Again, it's just the, the, the world that we're living in right now, you know, it's, we get it, it's scary. There's, there's all kinds of stuff to try to figure out, but there's also unbelievable amounts of opportunity to take advantage of this technology that we never could have dreamed of uh, before. And that's, uh, it's just cool to be able to be, uh, to be able to be a part of that and to have uh, just a Brookdale just embrace it in ways that frankly, I never could have imagined. I think one of the, the, you go to the next slide, but one of the, proudest things for me of anything I've seen, Juliet, is I think last year when we went over the 5 million hours of usage of, of our technology in Brookdale, and it really, it's it's pretty powerful. So yeah. Uh, so anyway, the, just to get a couple of examples, you're, you're able to socially distance, you can exercise. Uh, I think, you know, frankly, I think it's a great time to be living in a community like the picture on the right, the, the ability to give people the spirituality that's meaningful for them. Uh, and, and if there's a lot of people have uh, uh, side issues, different, you want to address the different issues. But again, it's fundamentally, uh, we're all the same wherever we are. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Next slide. Yeah. So, so anyway, just wrapping things up. I mean, again, I'm just going to to say it over and over again, but it's just, we're all unique. Uh, technology should be unique. It should, it's not a one size fit all. Uh, and, and Brookdale has really epitomized that just in the culture of how they deal with people living with dementia, uh, the joy that is still out there. If there's family members that are out there and, and it's, I, you know, it's tough and you know that there's so much angst that you're dealing with. But man, you, you get somebody connected with their song. You get them connected with a priest saying the rosary, whatever it may be. The joy is still there. Most organizations don't get it, uh, and, and Brookdale does. So the, the last slide is my last slide, and that um, is, is really just you, you look at examples like this. The lady on the right, uh, it, it's a tough, you get it, it's a tough time right now. We don't want to dwell on it, but it's cool to be able to keep people connected when it's not always easy to do in person. Juliet, that's, I don't want to steal another Brookdale story. Oh. Give, us the, give, it, give us the pilot there. I love yeah, that Yeah, you know, story. the gentleman on the left was uh, brand new uh, to, had had just recently moved into Clare Ridge, wasn't liking it so much, uh, wasn't uh, having uh, too good a time on his first 24 hours. And we discovered that he had been a pilot. Um, and uh, so we hooked him up with a flight simulator uh, game program that's a part of the It's Never Too Late. And he decided he was going to stay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was very happy at that point. Yeah. And so I guess just my last line is that uh, if you are uh, a son or daughter and, and, and dealing with that painful experience of, of, of having to, to put your mom in a community, absolutely demand engagement technology. And if you're dealing with Brookdale, you don't have to demand it because it's already there. So thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Sorry, my phone rang. Protocol speaker <laughs> protocol violation. Juliet will will address me later about. We'll that. talk to you later about it, right? Yeah. Jack, thank you so much. It is so incredible to see the residents with dementia thriving with all that technology from it's never too late. I love the flight simulator and the grandparents talking to their grandkids on that life size screen. Um, quick plug for our previous webinar. We had a webinar a couple of months ago on technology options that are perfect for seniors and some specifically made for them. You can all watch it um, on our website. If you go to brookdale.com slash in the know, it's also at the bottom of this screen. You can see all of our old webinars, including the one on technology and other topics. Um, also a reminder, you can pop your questions for Jack or Juliet in the Q&A below. So just click that and start en entering questions. We're gonna answer them at the end, but questions you have right now, please pop them in. We have a couple of people that have done it, but go ahead and do that. And we're gonna to get to those as soon as we're done. So thanks for that. So as we know, um, as dementia progresses, memories get lost, right? 
And memory well is one way that families can support and remember their loved one, even through the stages of dementia. So let's take a quick look at this video about Jay and her story. A lot of seniors have amazing stories that are being lost. Their quality of life depends almost entirely on how much you can engage them. And I think that biography is absolutely key to that. Memory Well is a platform for digital storytelling where we tell the life stories of seniors to help connect them with their caregivers. So whomever is sitting with them, whether it's a paid caregiver or a grandchild, they have a whole toolbox of things with which to engage them. My career has been in journalism, so I've spent 15 years as a national correspondent, either for Bloomberg News or Time Magazine. I became my dad's caregiver in 2011. So a few years ago, I moved him into a community, and when I did, they asked me to fill out this enormous 20-page questionnaire about his life. Who is ever going to read and remember 20 pages of handwritten data points for the more than 100 residents in that particular community? Nobody, right? So instead, I wrote down his story, and they loved it. They remembered it. They told each other about it. The fact of the matter is, is that most of these communities see, on average, 55 to 60 percent staff turnover annually. And there's a huge amount of new people that my dad and those residents are constantly having to introduce themselves to in a time where they really can't introduce themselves anymore. Memory Well was born from that experience. We now have a network of more than 600 writers that we work with across the country. We're in 35 assisted living facilities in 19 states. And then we have a digital platform where we host the stories and families can build on them and they can add in their loved one's favorite music and movies and arts and reading. So the stories aim to build connections and build empathy. Hi. Hi. I'm just gonna start at the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. So tell me your name and when you were born. My name is John H. Newby, and I was born on November 23rd, 1938. I joined the Army in 1965. I think everybody has that grandfather who every Thanksgiving you think, man, I really need to get his stories, and every Thanksgiving you don't do it, and that opportunity passes. So what did you study for a master's? Social work. Are you the only one with a master's degree in that generation? Right. My dad had Alzheimer's, and so telling my dad's story when he entered care really helped his caregivers understand him as a person rather than seeing him as a problem or a diagnosis. Everyone has a good story, and so this is my way of trying to give families a cheat sheet to get them to engage you know, as much and as long as possible. The transition moving someone into assisted living is one of the hardest, and being able to capture those stories, not just for their families to remember, but for society to know them, I think is really amazing and profound. Jay, that is so wonderful. That's wonderful. So uh, welcome, Jay. Welcome, Jay. Would you talk to us a little bit more about memory well and some of that work you're doing? Um, sure, they'd be, be happy to. Um, so Memory Well, as, I, as you saw in the video, grew out of my experience caregiving for my father. Um, and really, you know, um, when I moved him into the community where he was, they asked me to fill out this enormous 20-page questionnaire, which I think is fairly standard. Some, some communities have shorter ones, others have longer ones. This, this one in particular was very long. And I remember sitting there struggling with these questions, thinking, you know, I was literally a professional, you know, writer. I was a, at that moment in time a White House correspondent for Time Magazine, and I challenge anybody to answer some of those questions well. Like, you know, describe your parents' fifty-plus year marriage in four lines. That's like writing haiku. And so, I, you know, I really struggled with how, you know, how to best describe him for his caregivers. And he was he'd lost the ability to introduce himself at that point, and so. I ended up writing down his story and it really transformed his care. Um, two of his caregivers were Ethiopian and they'd had no idea that my father had actually lived in Ethiopia for more than four years early on in his career with the United Nations. And they became his champions. They would sit for hours and ask him what it was like to work with Emperor Haile Selassie and what the Empress was like. And so, um, you know, we, it really like, you know, made him, um, I think, feel at home in that community, and it made him feel known by everybody around him. Not just those two caregivers, but 
they had the story up all over the place. So people coming in, um, you know, to, to cut his toenails, the podiatrist, or to do his hair and shave his beard or, you know, trim his beard, or even the culinary staff got to know him really well. And, you know, and, and really, um, created such a great sense of community around him and around everybody else that, you know, other people in the community started asking to have their other, their stories told. And that's really how the company started. So um, we, you know, have been working with Brookdale now for, gosh, three years, I think. Um, and we um, have, you know, our life stories, but um, and we also have these amazing timelines that we can build, that families can build out. And we, we built the timelines in large part because when families looked at the stories, they're so brief. They, they, saw, they thought, well, goodness, you know, there's all these other things that happened in this person's life. You know, Uncle Joe would want to add the time when they went ice fishing in Michigan um, that they wanted to put the, those, those memories down. And so we, the timelines were giving, um, through Brookdale, uh, you can sign up for a timeline for free, um, and you can start telling your loved one's story right away, um, and giving those tools to, uh, their caregivers to engage them. And, they, and you'll see that when you do sign up for the timelines, we'll send weekly engagement questions, um, you know, to encourage you and your family to reminisce together. So you, you're really encouraged to invite your grandkids, your nieces and nephews, like really everybody, all friends and family to collaborate on this um, because it really is a joint virtual experience, intergenerational experience. And you often see so many great kids being so curious about their grandparents, especially now um, when they can't visit or when they might be stuck at home and saying like, oh, wow, grandpa, I had no idea you fought in Korea. Like, tell me more about that. Or, you know, or, or asking them about what it was like living through the Great Depression. Um, and so those, those engagement questions really do help prompt those conversations and help families get to know the life stories of these seniors, which are incredibly rich so much better and, and save them for posterity. Um, and so the cool thing about the timelines is that also that Brookdale staff uses them too. And so they can post videos and photos of their loved ones doing activities or doing different things in, in, in the communities. Um, and then that way, you know, especially in this tough time of COVID, when you can't visit, you can see for yourself how they're doing and, and really engage around them. So it's um, the timelines have become a really wonderful way, I think, for everybody to um, celebrate that senior, like get to know their life stories really in depth and in detail. Um, whether you're a paid staff member with Brookdale or whether you're, um, you know, somebody who uh, a family member, like a really close family member or even an extended family member or friend. Um, so... Uh, we also still offer life stories. This is for a fee that you would pay in addition to the timeline. Um, and that's just if you're struggling with the, the timeline, you don't know if you had to fill it out, where to start. Um, we have a writer who can get you started and get you down the road and we can do that brief life history. Um, and that also gives the, the caregivers at Brookdale a real cheat sheet of understanding your, your loved one. And those brief narratives are so much more digestible um, than oftentimes than handwritten, you know, questionnaires. Uh, it's just, they're really beautiful keepsakes for your family. You get to really cherish them. Um, you can print them out into books um, for also an additional fee. So um, they're really lovely Christmas gifts and holiday gifts, um, especially this year. So, uh, so yeah, between the timelines that you can build out yourself, which you can also print into a book or the stories themselves, um, we'd be happy to get you started in either one of those. Uh, and we think it's just so important to be able to capture so many of these senior stories um, right now, particularly for those living with Alzheimer's and dementia who might have their, their memories fading. And one of the things I just want to point out about the timelines is that those we, we built timelines in particular for Alzheimer's and dementia because um, it's so important to meet people where they are, right? So I used to visit my dad. And when I did, I'd be like, hey, dad, how old are we today? And, you know, how old, how old are you? And he would say, oh, if he said 30 or in his 30s, I knew it was going to be like a Beatles and Burt Kempfert day because that was like what he was really engaging with at that point. And if he said 50, I knew it was going to be a Simon and Garfunkel and MASH kind of day. And so um, being able to have those multimedia like interests and loves, um, at your fingertips from all those different eras enables you to really engage that person, go right to that, that decade and have all of those things right there to engage them with. So I just wanted to make that note about the timelines, how special that is and how great it is, particularly for Alzheimer's and dementia engagement. Um, so, you know, we really feel like there's so much evidence back up and Juliet spoke so much about it earlier 
that really um, telling people stories, knowing about your residents, knowing their life histories, person-centered care is, is really vital for person-centered care. And, and it is, and that has become the gold standard of care across the board and why it really, you know, we have to laud um, Brookdale for, for really enacting that gold standard of person-centered care in all of their communities. And so, um, you know, we found that 81% of families felt better about their loved one's care once the story was told, knowing that caregivers were going to read the stories, be able to interact with them and the timelines. And even 67% of paid staff members felt better about the care they were giving, having those stories, being able to reference those stories, being able to know their residents in, in so many different ways. It, it really made the whole experience much more special and much more bonding for them. Um, and I think I can't change slides anymore. So, <laughs> um, so uh, I might be at the end of this, but um, I, I just want to say how honored I am to be here today, how excited we are to work with everybody. Please like start a timeline. Um, we're really excited to, you know, start those timelines and you can always contact us if you have any questions. I'm very easily found at, you know, j at memorywell.com, which is just J-A-Y at memorywell.com. I can put it in the chat for anybody who's interested. And, um, and just also how great it is that Brookdale uh, engages in such person-centered care and, and really, um, you know, is found finding these ways, whether it's IN2L or whether it's um, our timelines to bridge this virtual, you know, this divide virtually um, when people can't visit in person. I think it's, it's amazing. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. It is so remarkable to see how you're helping tell the stories of these residents and uh, the timeline helps keep memories alive, that convey that sense of who our loved ones are, right? To our families, to the staff, even the future generations, as you said, I think that the life stories and the timelines would also really make a really wonderful holiday gift on top of that, so you're right. So thank you so much for that. So it is now time to hear from all of you. So we welcome your questions for Juliet, Jack, and Jay. If you would look at, look at the box at the bottom of your screen, click it, type in your question, hit send. I'll see your questions and then we'll have each speaker respond. We're gonna to get to as many questions as we can. And don't worry, like I said, you're all gonna get a follow-up email with all of the recording of this webinar so you can refer to it later, share it with your friends and loved ones, find it on our website as well, which is on the bottom of your screen. So let's get to our questions. And the first one, I saw this one come in and I love this question, Jack or Juliet, can you give some more details on the robot companion pets and are dogs available too? And how long do people normally get to have them for? Yeah, the, the robotic companion animals we've been using for a few years now. Um, they are uh, on the market. You can actually buy them at CVS um, as well, I think, um, for those of you who are still going out to drugstores. Um, it, but they're available online at joyforall.com. Uh, all one word, joyforall.com. And yes, they do have dogs um, and they have three different styles of the cat um, as well as they've just introduced a kitten um, as well, which is really adorable. So um, we have just smashing success with these uh, robots um, and, uh, and folks really, really enjoy them. Um, I think the question was, how long do they use them for? They can, yeah, how, long can they, how, how long do they get to have them? They, they can engage with them as long as they want. Um, and in fact, in many of our communities, we have several uh, so that uh, we don't have custody battles. <laughs> but, yeah. right, that would be bad. Yep. Um, another quick, quick question on this one, Jack, how often can the residents use and engage with the, um, with the different technology for the, uh, the what do we call it? I yeah, I, I can answer <laughs> generically and Juliet can speak to Brookville. Yeah. I think that, you know, the reality is that IN2L is a tool and communities use it in all different ways. And some people have it prominently displayed in the front lobby and some people set up specific times here and there. Uh, a lot of communities get multiple systems and tablets so they're able to have uh, the engagement take place uh, in, in, in different ways. So it's, it's always hard for us to generalize because we, we have, gosh, almost 3,500 communities with our technology and they, uh, they they do it very differently. So how would you answer that, Juliet, from a Brookdale standpoint? You know, we we use the IN2L for, for many hours of programming. I think we average about eight hours um, of usage per day. So we're able to see each community and how often they're using 
um, using the system, but also what content they're using. So we can tell um, if they're just, you know, um, playing music through it or if they're actually using some of the games and puzzles and, and brain games and those kinds of things. So we monitor that. The dementia care team um, monitors that. And we um, we have no trouble with, uh, with increasing that usage. Um, so about seven to eight hours a day, it's used in the communities. So it's used for individual, but it's also used for group. Um, when we have groups, um, uh, which we're not doing as many of now, obviously, uh, with COVID, but um, we can use it for any size group as well as individual. It can be rolled into somebody's room for private, you know, conversations. That's great. Thank you. Jay, we have a couple questions coming in for you on memory well, and one of them is, um, can when you do this, can it be for people other than dementia patients? Can anyone do this? Jay. Yep, sorry, I gotta always unmute. <laughs> this is the sign of the times. Um, yes, we can, you can absolutely do it um, for patients at home or anybody living at home. You know, when COVID started, we we made our timelines available. Um, and if you just go to our website, memorywell.com, you can see uh, there's a banner at the top of it that says, you know, sign up for your free timeline now. We wanted to be able to connect patients and families, or really just any seniors aging in place and families, because we were hearing so many heartbreaking stories of families just so isolated, the seniors so isolated, and they were dying of loneliness. We heard, you know, there was this one, um, you know, couple whose stories we'd actually done in Maryland, and they'd been married more than 60 years. And it was the saddest thing, you know, the, the wife started to see um, symptoms of COVID and they separated them. And the husband couldn't like live without her. I mean, he, they both had dementia and he just wouldn't eat and wouldn't sleep without her. He didn't know how to do how to do that anymore. And the, the facility in the community tried as much as they could to use the timelines to play his favorite music, to read him from, to him from his favorite books, to like show him photos of his wife from their history. And his, his, all three of their children wrote us these really lovely notes. And when, when they passed about how um, that had been really the, the saving grace towards the end, but, you know, ultimately he died of loneliness before she died. And then she died within a day after. And so just hearing these heartbreaking stories of these folks who were so, you know, lonely, um, aging in place. We've had, we've had so many letters from people who are really lonely. There's been studies done by senior list that show that 43% of um, seniors feel more lonely since the you know onset of COVID. Um, it's just so important to find ways to engage them. And so, yes, anybody can use our timelines, you know, for anything really. And we encourage you to, to, to go ahead and sign up. But it's important, I think, if you are, if you do have a loved one in Brookdale, Brookdale in particular, um, we, you know, offer a discount with Brookdale folks for the stories. And we also, um, once you sign up, you're then tied into that particular community and then staff can see those right. stories and can see those timelines and can use them. So it's, so Brookdale specifically, like if you, if you're in Brookdale or, going, or thinking about going to Brookdale, that's like a really great way. Cause that, that means the staff can be able to engage around that person as well and, and, and really communicate on those time that timelines as well. That's great. Thank you. We have a question coming in from Sarah. If residents can't remember how to operate the technology or make a call or use any of these great things, are there people available to help them get started? Or are there like regularly scheduled technology sessions for the different residents? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all of all technology, typically everything in Clarebridge pretty much is, is um, whether it's technology, whether it's dining, whether it's dressing, um, is assisted. I mean, that that uh, is why folks are living with us in Clarebridge. So um, technology is no different. Now, that's not to say that people can't learn to use these uh, systems by themselves. The IN2L is, is, is you know, particularly intuitive, um, very visual. We find that folks, um, even in the pretty late stages of dementia, will eventually learn, you know, um, their content is behind a, a button, uh, right? A place where they touch that has their picture or a picture that they might recognize um, readily. So we find people able to use the system pretty easily by themselves, but of course they're always assisted as well. Um, there's no limit on who can use uh, use the technology. Three o'clock in the morning, doesn't matter. It can, it can be used at any time of day. Yeah, and I think one thing that we've seen happen throughout this year is that a lot of the residents, wherever they are cognitively, 
that may have been skeptical of technology when it when it becomes the only way you can uh, talk to your granddaughter, <laughs> all of a sudden people will go through some of that pain to to learn it, and it uh, it it's it's been interesting to see just the adoption of these kinds of things so dramatically over the last year. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Another question for Jay. When you're documenting people that have dementia, um, a lot of people, obviously, they've started to lose their memory and, and they're not always, um, they're not always capable of telling their story. Do you, do you run into that? Absolutely. I, you know, we, so two things. One, you know, um, we don't like to correct people, right? So that's, that's we don't wanna make them feel like they're misremembering. We don't, we, um, we almost never correct people at all uh, when, we, when we're working with them. Um, but we always send the stories back to the families before uh, we put them up um, for approval so that families can change anything, correct anything, um, put anything up, you know, that they think is, is wrong or just you know, do whatever they want with them. Um, it's always the power of attorney that has that, that power to sort of change anything they want. Um, we certainly are not here to um, to to fact check you. So we so we had, for example, one really interesting story where um, a patient was a pathological liar, and that was a thing that he was, and he had these three really distinct personas, and those personas was one was a race car driver, one was like a surgeon who'd gone into Europe, you know, with Eisenhower after World War II, and um, and he told us these stories. They were fantastic stories. He was a great storyteller, and we presented them to the family, and the family was. Like, well, no, actually, he was a dentist. <laughs> and, like, and so, but they actually left it up. They, the family said, you know what, leave them up because that's where he is in his head. That's who he, he believes he is. And we don't want to correct him. We don't want to make him feel that's awkward great. or bad or, you know, that he's wrong in any way. So, so we left those stories up. Um, and so we really want to meet them where they are. As, as I said earlier, that's such a great way of putting it and making sure that they feel accepted and loved for, for who they are and is celebrated for that, even if it was wasn't exactly who they were <laughs> in real life. Yeah, that's great. Um, Juliet, could you tell us a little bit more about the Brookdale Clare Bridge locations? I know you said that a few times, and I think people in our audience may not know what that is. Could you tell us a little bit about those? Sure. Clare Bridge is the name for everything dementia care at Brookdale. So we have, I think, 363 as of today locations that offer our Claridge program. So the Claridge program is always offered in a in a separate location, um, and it it is its own residence um, uh, and its own community. Um, we also have, I think I mentioned Crossings, which is our early stage dementia program. We have in about 12 locations. That's not offered as widely. Um, but our Claridge uh, programs are throughout the country uh, and in over 360 locations. This is a, another one's a great question. Um, since assisted living facilities really only came into existence in the 80s, what are your recommendations on telling our loved ones that we're making this choice for them to live in one instead of living alone because they may have in mind that they're being sent off, right? With the yeah. associated stigma of a nurse home. When you look at the stuff going on at Brookdale, like this is a completely different world. How do you, and, and what advice can you give people and how to sell this idea to people, to their loved ones and get them to understand it's a very different world? Yeah, I have two bits of advice on that. The first would be don't wait until to have that conversation until you need it. And that includes all of us as uh, boomers, right? We need to um, be thinking about our own futures. And so in your 60s, 70s, and early 80s, before you uh, may need um, these types of, of uh, locations, you know, it, to start to think about it yourself. Um, so that's one bit of advice. Advanced planning is always good. I think, um, I think it's interesting the, the, the perception that people have um, and the, 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 there's a lot of daylight between the perception people have of um, care homes, let's just call them, and, and what's really out there. My, Father is a great example. He just moved in recently to a uh, CCRC campus and to an independent living um, community. It's almost too fancy for him, uh, but he still had this really negative perception of the nursing home and the dementia care and the assisted living. So go look at them. 
And he did. And he, boy, those are pretty nice places, you know? Yeah, they are really nice places. So I think the other um, advice would be, you know, to, to come and tour and uh, to get people um, into the space to experience it for themselves. You know, we offer respite care in every single one of our Clarebridge locations. And this is a great opportunity for caregivers uh, to, to take a break. Um, sometimes it's, it's, uh, it can be very helpful to just take a week um, if you're in that caregiving situation at home. It's also a great way for people to get used to uh, living in uh, memory care um, for both the caregiver and for the person living with dementia. So uh, touring and certainly getting yourself into the space, um, but also utilizing that respite uh, care can be a really helpful way to, uh, to dispel some of those um, false ideas about what it looks like uh, on the inside or what it is on the inside. If I can add to that, um, I did a I did an entrepreneur in residence program with um, with Brookdale, and I actually lived in a crossings community in Fort Collins, Colorado, and um, for a week. And I have to say, it was it, it was not at all what I expected. You know, I was sort of bracing for something like you know that might be a little like you know grammar, you know, sort of like thinking thinking back to my experience with my father that might be a little disturbing. You know, my dad had a lot of behavioral issues towards the end, and and I, what I found was this amazing community where I mean these like these ladies beat me at bingo like you know they were really good um and these and they would all it was so cool like during mealtime they all would start to jam and so like one person would start to like tap their spoon and then another person would start to tap their plate and like by the like literally within five minutes into the meal, all of them were like humming along to this song. I don't even know what it was, but every single meal they would do this together. And it was so sweet. It was just the sweetest thing I've ever seen. And, you know, it was just really great to see the, the community that they formed together and how like they gelled as like, you know, they a group and, um, and sort of how they like were musically inclined. And yeah, so I just, I found, I found it a really great experience. And I, so I, I also encourage you to visit one. It's not at all what you might think it is. That's awesome. Well, what a wonderful sense of community, right? So Julia, Jack and Jay, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks to all of you for being here and for all your great questions. Again, we're going to email you a recording of this and the transcript of this webinar so you can view and share with your family and friends. Please come back and join us on December 17th. We're going to have our next webinar on navigating family dynamics in our new normal. That'll be a good one, right? You can register on brookdale.com slash in the know. And our webinars feature a different subject every month. So we do hope we'll see you again soon. You can find past webinars on our website as well. So please check those out. Please join us again. And until next time, we hope you stay safe, happy, and well. Thank you so much. Thank you.